If you would turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, and we're going to start reading in a few minutes uh, at Luke 5.27, which is going to cover what we went over last week as a preparation for this week. But as you're turning there, um, I'm going to give you something of a lar- long introduction, which does not mean the sermon's going to be extra long, but it does mean that I want to set the table really well for the meal that we're about to have. Last week, we saw that Jesus passed by the tax booth of Levi and called that notorious sinner to follow him. Tax collectors in Israel, as we saw last week, were well known for extorting exorbitant amounts of money, for taking bribes from the rich, for thievery, for loan sharking, and for being so dishonest that their word was never to be trusted, especially in court. Everyone knew Levi was a moral mess. Everybody. They knew it. Uh, He couldn't hide behind a facade of self-righteousness. Um, Why? Because it was evident to all that he had no righteousness of his own, only sin. And when Christ called him to become a devoted disciple for a lifetime, Levi knew that he had to leave behind everything, every last thing, to abandon his life of sinful rebellion against God so that he might obediently follow the Son of God, who alone could give him the righteousness that he needed necessary for salvation. Levi knew he was a sinner. And by faith, he left his sinful life behind to follow the only one who was truly righteous, Jesus. But there were others who had a higher view of themselves, typified by the Pharisees. They believed themselves to be truly righteous. And so they didn't feel their need for the righteousness that can only be received through faith in Christ. Unlike Israel's founding patriarch, Abraham, whose faith was accounted to him as righteousness by God, Israel's religious leader over the years, and actually over hundreds of years, developed the idea that religious acts like frequent fasting and uh, set times of prayer would obligate God to credit them with righteousness for their good behavior. They believed that they could earn righteousness by their own works. This twisted theology began to take hold. God's people exchanged the true holy, the true worship of Yahweh for external show, paying lip service to God's holiness while sin took root in their hearts. And outward acts of piety replaced honest confession and repentance from sin that accompanies genuine faith. Like actors playing a role in a stage, their sacrificial acts and deeds of devotion became theater. They treated God like a vending machine. Think about it. We put a buck 75, right? Whatever it costs for a candy bar in the machine. And we expect this to give us that, you know, yummy Snickers or three musketeers or, you know, nut bar, or whatever you like, right? Um, they thought of God in the same way that, that fasting or praying religiously in the sight of their vending machine God um, for them was like putting money that they'd earned into the coin slot and, and, and God must respond with sweet candy bar blessings, right? That's how they looked at God. Their relationship to God became purely mechanical and the true fellowship of faith was lost. But God, through the prophet Isaiah, had made clear that prayers offered with incense and sacrifices and other religious activities like fasting are an offense to God when they proceed from faithless hearts. That if we think that we can earn God's approval for outward acts of piety, God says, no, that's not how it works. God cried out to Israel in Isaiah 1, 11 through 15, and I just want you to hear the, 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 the tremendous emotion in God's voice as he speaks through Isaiah. God says this, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord, I've had enough of burnt offerings and of rams and of the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who is required of you this trampling of my courts? See, they were coming to bring offerings for the sins they really didn't think they had. That just somehow making those sacrifices made them righteous. And God says, no, you're not coming to me by faith. Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. And incense pictures prayers. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, all their church services. God says, uh, I cannot endure iniquity, sin, and your solemn convocations. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, your get-togethers, religious ones, my soul hates 
and they have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. In other words, when you go to pray. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. God is speaking to self-righteous people. Self-righteous good works do not make us righteous. Instead, frankly, they separate us from God. That's not why we do good things. That's not why we obey God's law, right? We don't do it to achieve righteousness. That can only be had through faith in Christ. So God called, uh, through Isaiah, called his people to repent of their false religion and to turn to God for cleansing. But many still clung to external acts of piety for righteousness. And the Pharisees were the primary examples. They couldn't see how sinful they truly were. And they persisted in clinging to the false idea that their outward commitment to works righteousness in fulfilling the outward letter of the law would please God, even as they ignored the primary purpose of the law, which was to show us how sinful we truly are and drive us to Jesus Christ for cleansing through faith, recognizing that only he can cleanse our sin and make us truly clean. So think about this. The Pharisees at Levi's party were just such people. Uh, they tithed scrupulously. They fasted twice weekly. They prayed religiously, and they thought by doing so they could place God in their debt so that God would be forced to bless them because they were so good, even when their hearts were far from him. And their influence was pervasive. Kind of like the TV preachers of today, the they are the pastors that most of the nation listen to. They were the influencers. They preached a robotic religion with an impersonal God who they could manipulate with their righteous acts, all the while while failing to realize that sin was an issue of the heart and that true righteousness can never be earned but only received as a gift by faith in Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the main point of today's text, and the introduction is almost over. What's the main point? Believers depend solely upon Christ for righteousness. Believers depend solely on Christ for righteousness. Why? Because true righteousness can only be ours as a gift from Christ by faith. So, if you would, you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 5, 27, and let's stand in honor of the reading of God's word. And we're going to read from verse 27 all the way to 39, and then we'll pray. Luke 5, 27 says this, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new, from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. This is God's word for you today. Let's pray. Father God, this morning I pray that uh, through your word you would remove from us all false trust in our own righteousness. We ask that you would please expose the emptiness of our self-righteousness so, so that we rely only on the, on the righteousness of Christ and not on our own. 
Please tear down everything in our hearts that exalts itself and cause us to throw ourselves at your son's feet. Help us to worship him as the only righteous one and the one upon all our hope for heaven is founded. pray this in his name. Amen. Please be seated. So look at verse 33 with me, if you will. That's where we're going to start today. Verse 33. They, the Pharisees, Luke is pointing back to, and we're going to see it's more than them that are speaking. And they said to them, and they said to him, excuse me, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. See, just as last week's passage centered on Jesus' response to an objection by the Pharisees, today's passage begins with another complaint by the same group. And just as the Pharisees protested that Jesus and his disciples shouldn't be associating with unclean sinners and tax collectors around Levi's table, they now criticize Jesus for allowing his disciples to enjoy Levi's banquet instead of fasting and praying like them. What's funny is Matthew 9.14 tells us that the disciples of John the Baptist joined the Pharisees and the scribes in this very same complaint. And Mark adds, and this might account for some of their grumpiness, that both groups or complainers are already fasting on that day when they level this criticism against them. So I don't know if it's their lunch hangry that's going on, but they're, you know, they're criticizing Christ. Why were they fasting? Because they're fasting at this moment. Okay, the Old Testament records many fasts, right, for God's people. And typically, it was a time of where God's people needed to repent because God had promised judgment if they didn't. So the king or the prophet would call them to a fast for repentance, and, and they would do that. But there's only one fast in the Old Testament that was an ongoing fast for God's people, and it was on the Day of Atonement. Um, and the Day of Atonement, they would fast, they would, they would recognize that, that uh, they would mourn their sins and that a substitute lamb needed to be sacrificed to take away their sins. It was a time of mourning. And that was the only fast that was incumbent upon all Hebrew people. I think it's Leviticus 17, uh, no, Leviticus 16 commands all Hebrews and all so- sojourners, all strangers in Israel at that time, once a year, in solemn recognition of their sins and their need for a substitutionary sacrifice to pay the price of those sins to fast. And what did that sacrifice point to? Jesus who was the true sacrifice for the sins of all who trusted uh, him for righteousness. So so why are they fasting? This isn't the Day of Atonement. By the first century, one scholar notes that instead of one required day of fasting each year, the Pharisees had decried that godly people should fast two times a week, twice a week, on uh, the second and fifth day of the week. So Mondays and Thursdays. So don't plan on eating tomorrow, all right? And don't plan on eating much on Thursday. But it wasn't as, as uh, I mean, and they, they, they wanted you to know they were fasting all day. But the truth is they did it from sunup till sundown, which I looked today. That began at 6.54 a.m. this morning and uh, would end t- at about 7.02 this evening. So the funny thing is that allowed you to eat a pretty hearty breakfast at a normal time, skip lunch because you'd eaten enough for breakfast to kind of tide you over, and they just delayed dinner by about an hour and call it a whole day's fast. See how that works? See how that works? And the Pharisees made it into this big production. They would intentionally try to look gloomy in public while they were fasting and disfigure their faces. In fact, one historian said they would whiten their faces. They'd look extra emaciated. You know, they're walking around skipping lunch, you know, like it's a big deal. Um, They're fasting. uh, Jesus said they would disfigure their faces so their fasting would be seen by others, Matthew 6, 16. Philip Ryken writes that they refused to wash and wore their clothes in shoddy disarray so that they could look as forlorn as possible. And this fast wasn't a recognition of sins for which they needed God's forgiveness, but something they believed not only earned them righteousness before God, but showed off their righteousness to everybody. Uh, and, and, and it brought the applause of others who were taken in by their charade of holiness, right? Their self-righteousness blinded them to their need for Christ. And it kept them from feeling their need for fellowship with Christ, which a dining room full of sinners at Levi's house puts on display. So here's the first point I see in our passage today, the priority of fellowship with Christ for believers. 
the priority of fellowship with Christ, and that's in verses 33 to 35. Verse 33 again says, And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And so when they say yours to Jesus, they're essentially saying that Jesus' disciples never join them in their ritualistic fasting and prayers that they thought were obligatory on everybody, and because Jesus is their rabbi, they hold him responsible. What are they accusing him of doing? Wrong, sin. They're accusing the only righteous guy in the room of sin, right? At the core, that's what they're accusing Jesus of doing, and they do so, why? Because they don't accept who he really is and what he came to do. And Jesus responds by making a comparison of something very similar. Look at verse 34. Jesus says to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Jesus, answering the, Jesus answers them by picturing something very familiar, uh, a traditional Hebrew wedding um, would really be like, uh, you know how we, somebody gets married and then they go on a honeymoon. That's not how it worked. A Hebrew wedding would essentially be a whole week-long affair of an open house, right? No honeymoon, but you would invite guests to come, and the invited guests would come and and. Uh, for a week, they would feast with you. They'd drink wine with you, by the way, which explains why Jesus probably made so much wine for the wedding of Cana, because it probably had to last over several days, right? And the only job that guests had, the only job was to make the newly married couple happy. That was it. In fact, it was against the rules to be sad. And, and so Jesus makes this comparison because in, that, in a wedding, in a, in a wedding uh, uh, week-long celebration, no mourning was allowed. And to quote one hysteri- historian, even the obligation of the prescribed daily prayers ceased. It was regarded as a religious duty to gladden the bride and the bridegroom. Don't miss this. Jesus is calling himself the bridegroom. And he's calling his disciples the wedding guests and the other people around the table, the wedding guests. And this might have rung a bell in the minds of John's disciples who were joining the Pharisees and asking the same question. Why aren't you fasting with us? Jesus says he's the bridegroom. They might remember that John the Baptist, their discipler, called Jesus the bridegroom. In John 3, 28 and 29, and he called himself the friend of the bridegroom. Listen to what John the Baptist said. He said, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. He's talking about Jesus. The friend of the bridegroom, he's talking about himself, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He, Jesus, must increase. I, John, must decrease. Why is Jesus called the bridegroom? Because the New Testament pictures the relationship of Christ to all who trust in him for salvation as an intimate relationship pictured by that of husband and wives. Christ is the groom, the husband for whom Jesus would lay down his life. And that's why, gentlemen, Ephesians 5, if you are a husband, calls you to love your wife sacrificially as Christ because your job is to show the world Christ's love as you treat your wife in that way, sacrificially loving her. Christ is the groom. He's the bride of his church, and the church is everyone for whom Jesus would lay down his life to satisfy divine justice against them for their sins. They alone receive his perfect righteousness as a gift by faith. Only those who trust in Christ receive that gift, and that's why believers depend solely upon Christ for righteousness. He's the only source. We don't try to earn righteousness by good works or penitent fasting or mechanical prayers. Why? Because Jesus is the source of our righteousness. And that brings us joy that is not centered in ourselves or our performance, but joy that is centered in Christ alone. Good works are a result of, of salvation, a result of being saved by Christ on the basis of his righteousness, not as a means to earn it. And the celebration Levi shared around the dining room that day was a sample of the joy that those who come to Christ by faith have as they experience intimate fellowship with Jesus who has saved them from their sins. So Jesus answers the complainers with a question of his own. Can you make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Can you do that? 
And the sentence in Greek requires no. It requires a no for an answer. It's unreasonable to compel or expect wedding guests to fast, which pictures mourning. But they're commanded to celebrate. You can't do that while the bridegroom is with them. And the Pharisees couldn't reject Jesus' reasoning. Why? Because, to quote one, one historian, not even Pharisees, for all their fascination with fasting, would miss out on a good wedding reception. As it is said in one of the rabbinical writings, and here I'll quote, all in attendance on the bridegroom are relieved of all religious observances. Oh, how convenient. <laughs> Which would lessen their joy, right? Yeah, end quote. Jesus is expressing his relationship to those whom he will save in the most intimate of terms. He's the bridegroom. Believers are his blood-bought bride, the ones for whom he would sacrifice himself, and their joy in Christ's righteousness must never give place to those who exchange faith in Christ for self-righteous works. Believers depend solely upon Christ for righteousness, and they prioritize fellowship with him over everything else. They prioritize fellowship with Jesus over everything else. Notice, what's the very first thing Levi does when Jesus calls him to follow him and he gets up and he follows him? Throws a feast, invites his friends. I want them to meet Jesus too, right? Fellowship with Christ, who is our life, who is our righteousness, is the priority that's, that's exemplified in that beginning section. But then Jesus points to the day when in the providence of his father, he will be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and led away to be crucified on a cross. And they will mourn the loss of, the fellowship for the, of their fellowship with Christ for a time. And fasting will be an appropriate response. Look at verse 35. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Jesus is foreshadowing his arrest and crucifixion. And as Jesus said in John 16, 20, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Why does Jesus speak of his crucifixion here? Because that's where his life was freely sacrificed, in the place of notorious sinners like me and like you. The just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that we might receive the righteousness of God through faith in him right? And because we know that we have no righteousness of our own, believers depend solely upon Christ for righteousness. And we do that by faith. Do I sound like a broken record? I want you to get that. Believers depend solely upon Christ for righteousness. I'm going to say it probably 10 more times. So there'll be a quiz at the end. Here we go. All right. Belie believers, if you like me have ever been like the Pharisees, I have. And maybe you, you've struggled with pride at some point. Or you ever thought you were pretty self-sufficient, spiritually speaking. Or that you weren't quite as sinful as that person sitting next to you, you know, that Cowboys fan. And that your standing before God was higher because of your goodness. And maybe you've enjoyed the applause and the approval of others when you did some really good things in their presence. And you were secretly rejoicing inside when others noticed that you did them. Been there? Isn't it funny how even believers who trust in Christ for righteousness can, can be kind of self-sufficient sometimes, sinfully so? Let me encourage you, if you're like me and struggle from time to time with that, remind yourself daily that the only true righteousness we have is from Jesus. That brings humility that I need and you need. And anything we ever do that's truly righteous is done by Christ, through us, by his indwelling spirit, why? Because apart from Christ, we can do nothing good. Not one. And that removes the ground for our boasting in anyone but him. It drives us to fellowship with him because we, although we are nothing, he is our everything. And, and we know joy in intimate relationship with him. So can I, can I just point out something that's probably obvious to you? There is a world of difference between those who strive to earn their own righteousness before God by works and those who fellowship with Christ because he is their righteousness. World of difference. Now, think about it. Which of those two priorities pictures your life? Believers who depend solely on Christ for righteousness will prioritize fellowship with the one who has purchased their justification 
which is just another way of saying it's purchased them being declared righteous by the Father. Second section starts here, verse 36 through 38. And I think here we're going to see an illustration of the incompatibility of faith and self-sufficiency. Faith and working for your own righteousness. It's important to keep in mind that the issue that was in tension between Jesus and the religious leaders who were crucifying him this day was the fact that the Pharisees believed that their own religious efforts earned them righteous standing before God. And Jesus came to save sinners who believe in him for true righteousness that they could never earn. And Jesus points out just how incompatible it is to hold these two ideas at the same time. You can't because they don't fit. Square pegs, round holes. They don't work together. There is zero compatibility between legalistic self-righteousness and trusting in Christ for true righteousness. These ideas will never shake hands because they're entirely incompatible. And that's why, that's just what Jesus explains by telling them a parable. Again, by explaining a truth by comparison to something they're very familiar with. Um, in this case, he uses the idea of how clothing is repaired. And this takes me back to when I was a kid. Y'all know the term scotch? I don't mean the drink. I don't mean the people group. I mean people that, are, uh, that save every penny. My mom was scotch, right? She, 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 and she'd say, yeah, I'm, I'm scotch. I, she didn't throw away anything. When she and my, my dad passed away and we ended up uh, emptying their home, there were stacks and stacks and stacks of cottage cheese containers back from the 70s. I don't know how, I, you could have you you filled up the garage with something with those containers, but she wouldn't throw them away. Why? She was scotch. There was value, and she was never to set aside anything that she thought had some value. Well, as a child, I had two kinds of clothes. Church clothes, right, which you could never wear outside of church. And one time I did, and I got in big trouble. And, and other clothes, like the jeans you'd wear to school and stuff like that. And when you got holes in your jeans... My mom was scotch. So what did she do? She had patches from this big down to this big that she'd iron on and sometimes stitch around the outside if she thought I was going to wear them out too fast. And, and so I had clothing that was frequently patched. I did not think that was cool. My mom thought it was eminently practical. And that uh, was an awful lot like first century Israel. They had a similar view. Why? They couldn't go to Walmart and buy a, a shirt and pair of pants for 10 bucks off the, off the sale rack like we might could. Clothes were made by hand, and especially for regular people like you and me, wardrobes were much, much smaller. You didn't have many changes of clothes, and each piece of clothing was quite valuable. <laughs> Therefore, you wouldn't throw away a garment if it could be properly repaired, and that's the basis for what Jesus says next. He tells, tells them a parable. Look at verse 36. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. People just don't do that, is what he's saying. If he does... And by the way, it's an impossibility. People don't do this, but he's saying if they did, here's the result. He'll tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. Now again, no one at this time and place in their right mind would ever think to cut up a brand new piece of clothing to patch up an old one, right? To do so would ruin the new one, and the patch wouldn't match. And that's the idea here. The word match is translated from the Greek word, you could probably hear an English word in the midst of this, symphoneo. Do you hear the word symphony? All right? Um, by the way, the word symphony is much later, so I don't want to be anachronistic and take a, a meaning from today and throw it back on the old. But they have a common root that maybe helps illustrate it. Um, the meaning of the, the original meaning of symphoneo means to agree with, right? And, that, and again, it precedes our, mon our modern concept of a symphony, but they share a basic idea, and that is of what is suitable, what, what goes together. Just like a kazoo in the middle of a Beethoven symphony. Beethoven didn't, didn't write that kind of instrumentation, you know, on his score, you know, you know, <laughs> ba -da -da -da. you know, you could hear it, right? And Jesus is emphasizing that the gospel message that, that we are all are righteous uh, or unrighteous sinners who may receive the righteousness of Christ through faith alone is totally incompatible like a kazoo in a symphony totally incompatible with the idea that you can earn righteousness through good works. The Pharisees were self-sufficient, trusting in their religiosity for God's approval. And Jesus said he came to save sinners who knew they were sinners. 
and not those who mistakenly believe that they were righteous on their own, right? Do you see how those two things don't work together at all? They cannot. Faith in Christ is totally incompatible with works righteousness. Self-sufficient people, spiritually speaking, do not admit their total need for Christ. Why? Who are they depending on? Themselves. These two ideas don't fit together. They don't match. They're not harmonious. They don't agree with one another, and they never will. And in case that first parable wasn't clear enough, Jesus tells them another with a similar idea. Look at verse 37. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it'll be spilled. The skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. So again, in the first century, um, grapes were crushed into grape juice at, in the vineyards themselves by, by workers who were using bare feet. And, and it wasn't uncommon for them to, uh, in the stone nearby the bedrock nearby where the vineyard was, they would carve out a place for those grapes to be placed and crushed. So imagine a a fairly large area with kind of a lip around it carved out of the stomp for the stompers to crush, right? And then they would carve out a little, uh, kind of like a little trough area where the the grape juice could begin to run downhill into a larger area where the grape, grape juice would be collected. And because on the outside of the grape skins and and frankly, on the feet of the stompers, there was yeast. Um, the fermentation process would begin very quickly. In fact, some records indicate that you could even see bubbles in the catch basin where the, grace, or where the grape juice was caught because the, formation, the fermentation process began rather quickly. All right, so this new wine then is quickly stored in leather bags or wineskins, which were, imagine uh, taking the, the skin off a sheep or goat in as whole of a fashion as you can, sewing up maybe the leg holes and maybe leaving the neck hole as the place where you pour things in. Get the idea? They would tan the skins a bit, but when, because these were new skins, they were flexible. And when the wine was poured in and continued in its fermentation process, it would outgas carbon dioxide, right? And so what would happen is those skins would need to be able to expand with that gas so that they wouldn't burst and pour out all the wine. Got it? All right. Now, the problem was, just like um, uh, some of y'all's car leather seats in the hot sun of Albuquerque have baked for a while and gotten uh, stiff and cracked. You, anybody? <laughs> Old wineskins lose their flexibility right? And so if you tried to pour new wine in an old wineskin that had already reached its maximum stretching capacity, guess what? When that carbon dioxide built up, what would happen? Kaboom. And you've lost all your wine. And not only that, you destroyed the wineskin, right? That's the picture. All right. They didn't have the refrigeration methods we had today. So, so uh, this process would have been obvious and known by all. And see, only new wineskins would be able to preserve the wine as it aged. Now, this parable pictures the destructive effects of combining the new wine of the gospel of faith in Jesus Christ with works righteousness, old wineskins. Got it? You see that? The new wine of salvation through faith in Christ, of righteousness by faith in Christ, with the old wineskin of works righteousness. New wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And this parable pictures the destructive effects of trying to combine the true gospel with works. The saving truth of Christ is for hearts made new. Hearts regenerated by the Holy Spirit who exercise the Spirit-given gifts of repentance from sins, including the sin of self-righteousness and who place their faith in Christ alone for his righteousness, which is totally a gift of God, of God's grace through Jesus. True believers know that they have no righteousness of their own. We must be made new to to contain the gospel. Praise God, that's what he does. We depend solely upon Christ for righteousness. And so far, we've seen that believers prioritize fellowship with Jesus, who is our righteousness. We've also seen the incompatibility between faith and spiritual self-sufficiency. And now, in one verse, we're going to see the deadly satisfaction of self-righteousness. 
the deadly satisfaction of self-righteousness. Jesus told them, verse 39, and no one after drinking old wine desires new. For he says, the old is good. The old is good. Wine connoisseurs like cheese tasters and coffee drinkers have their preferences, don't they? Okay, uh, Starbucks? Blonde roast. Y'all are wrong. Okay. Oh, hey, there's one. Okay, good. <laughs> Someone who prefers red wine or Swiss cheese or dark roast may turn up their nose when offered white wine, cheddar, or a cup of blonde, right? Right? I'm one of those people that finds something I like and I eat that for the rest of my life. It's true. Um, I order the same thing from a restaurant every time unless my diet's forcing me to do something different. Uh, I always want biscuits and gravy when I go to Wex. Doesn't matter what time of day, time of night. And I want them to bring the red and the green chili sauce. Yeah, right? You know, every time. I don't care what else is on the menu. You got something new? Great. That's for other people. I want that. If I have soda, I never drink Pepsi, only Coke. We're a divided family that way. Um, I've never had a sandwich from the subway across the street, and I've had a number of them that didn't have tuna fish on it. And it took me years to quit drinking Starbucks dark roast because I was unwilling to try any other. Why? In terms of food, I'm set in my ways. And I'm not really interested in trying anything new. I like what I like, right? But when Jesus says no one after drinking old wine desires new, he's using the old wine drinker's fundamental unwillingness to consider anything else unwillingness to consider, even to consider anything else, to demonstrate the reality that self-sufficient people who believe that they themselves are righteous and think that they can win God's approval through, through performing pious actions will not even consider the truth of the gospel. Huge stumbling block, isn't it? Self-righteousness, self-sufficiency will keep you from Christ. Why? Because you won't feel your need. You won't desire anything else. Why would you think you need Jesus if you think you can meet God's standards without him? Some people really believe that. And as Jesus said in Luke 5.32, quote, I've not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. The righteous are those who think they can earn God's approval on their own. The sinners are those that know they cannot without Christ. And only the sinners will hear Christ's call to repentance. Truth is, everybody's sinners, but not everybody knows it, and only the ones that know it are going to hear. As John MacArthur points out, quote, like wine drinkers sloshing that familiar drink, people stubbornly cling to their comfortable religious traditions and have little or no interest in the new, fresh, saving truth of the gospel. Only those who, by the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, come to understand that they are not righteous people and that they have no hope of ever being righteous in God's eyes by their own works. They are the ones who come to see the end of their own self-sufficiency and will turn to Christ for his. Christ's sufficiency is what we need. Self-sufficiency is the road to hell. The gospel reveals our need for a righteousness from God, a righteousness we can ob obtain by obedience to the law even. Even though the law is good, we can't obtain righteousness by obeying it. Galatians 2.16 says a person is not justified by works of the law because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Even though the law itself is good, it cannot save you. It can only justly condemn you for your sinfulness, and point you to Christ because only Jesus can save sinners who believe. We cannot make up for old sinful actions of the past by doing good works now. Ephesians 2.9 explicitly says, salvation is not of works so that no one may boast. It takes divine grace to wipe the slate clean and keep it that way. And God's saving grace is given only to those who give up on themselves and, in, and give up on their sinful past and turn in faith to Christ. Believers depend solely upon Christ for righteousness. If you are a believer, you know this is true. 
You understand that the only thing you had to offer was the sin that brought God's wrath upon you in the first place. The gospel stripped you of your false self-righteousness. It drove you from your old sinful life and to your Savior in faith for forgiveness and cleansing. And And in exchange for your old sinful life, what did he give you? You were clothed with the perfect righteousness of God. Christ's righteousness given to you, and the Father declared you justified. Truly righteous in His eyes. And now whatever works you do for God are not to earn righteousness, but simply to please Him. Why? Because He has already saved you. That's where the works come from. You need not ride that treadmill of works righteousness anymore because your righteousness comes from Christ alone if you've trusted in him. But if you're still on that endless treadmill of self-righteousness, I warn you, please know that it will get you nowhere except to hell. And those who run on it will be worn out by it and will face eternal judgment. Eternal judgment is for those who are depending on themselves for, right, for righteousness. It is my prayer that God will, if you're on that treadmill, enable you to see and desire to taste the truth that Jesus alone can make you right with God. Give up your self-sufficiency and turn to Christ. He alone is sufficient to save. Depend on Christ alone to make you righteous, not yourself. Quit trying to patch up your old life with fake good works. Faith in Jesus and self-sufficiency will never fit together. You cannot contain Christ's grace in your own life. It'll burst it. Instead, by faith, come to him and let him remake you into a new person, and he will fill you with his spirit never to be empty again. And you will know true and lasting fellowship with the Son of God for eternity. Repent from your sin. Confess him as your Savior. Confess him as your Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And you will know the peace and freedom that comes in depending solely upon Christ for righteousness. Let's pray. Father, thank you that the gospel is the power of salvation for those who believe. Thank you that no one is beyond your reach. Thank you that every single person who turns to Christ in faith, confessing their sins, repenting and turning to him for life, We'll find it. Jesus said, all that come to me, I will not cast out. Lord, I pray that if someone here today does not know you, that they would know their need for Christ and that you would give them a taste or a desire to drink in the gospel and obey and come to Christ in humility and know what real life is. And I pray for any of us believers, Lord, that have Pharisaic tendencies sometimes that show up in our heart that we would constantly remind ourselves that Christ is our righteousness and that we stand before you perfect in him and that the works we do are simply a result of the love that you've placed in our heart that we must pour back out to you and to others. Thank you for such great grace, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.